Imagine that you travel to the moon and look back at the Earth. From that vantage point, you can see our beautiful blue planet floating against the darkness of space. Given that nearly three quarters of Earth's surface is covered with water, a better name for our world might be ocean. If we strip away the clouds, we can see that the oceans are not separate, isolated bodies, but a vast, interconnected system of water supporting a great diversity of life. This program will look at some of the common creatures that live in the cold, coastal waters of the Gulf of Maine, creatures that are usually hidden beneath the surface of the sea. In the western North Atlantic, we find the Gulf of Maine. The Gulf is bordered by land on the west and north, from Cape Cod, Massachusetts in the United States to Nova Scotia, Canada. Its shallow underwater banks separate the Gulf from the deeper, saltier, and warmer Atlantic waters to the east and south. The combination of cold, nutrient-rich freshwater feeding into the Gulf of Maine from rivers and a cold current off the coast of Nova Scotia give its waters a counterclockwise current that takes three months to circle the Gulf completely. Organic and inorganic particles floating in the Gulf of Maine make the waters quite cloudy. The organic particles are called plankton, a term that comes from the Greek word planktos, meaning wanderer. Plankton is considered to be any plant or animal in the water that cannot swim well enough to overcome the current. There are two types of plankton. Phytoplankton consists of tiny, often one-celled plants that use photosynthesis to convert nutrients in the water into chemicals vital to marine life. Zooplankton refers to animal plankton. The smallest zooplankton consists of single-celled animals, but the category also includes tiny crustaceans called copepods, free-floating fish eggs, and the larval forms of animals such as lobsters, shrimp, and snails. This baby snail is not much bigger than a grain of rice. The beating rows of cilia propel the snail, or velager as it's called, through the water. We can see the spiral shape of the shell and the inner workings of its digestive tract. Copepods, which you see here magnified, form a major component of the zooplankton and are among the most numerous animals on Earth. Copepods feed on phytoplankton and they, in turn, are an important source of food for many species of fish and whales. Because of their small size, only about a millimeter long, water feels very sticky to copepods, much as swimming in molasses would feel to humans. When a copepod swims, it leaves a unique disturbance in the water like the wake of a boat. These disturbances could be considered the footprints made by the copepod as it steps through the sticky water. These footprints can give other zooplankton a clue to what kind of animal swam there before. If it is prey, they try to capture it. If it is a mate, they follow the trail. But if it is the strong signal of a predator, they run away. Not all zooplankton, however, require a microscope to be seen. This sea gooseberry is a little over an inch in diameter, but its comb plates, which beat in sequence to propel it through the water, are too weak to overcome the prevailing current, making it a member of the plankton. Like jellyfish, sea gooseberries, also called comb jellies, are gelatinous and fragile, but unlike jellyfish, they don't sting. Near to shore, you can sometimes see schools of fish swimming in these plankton-rich waters. These immature pollock, known as harbor pollock, are a common inshore school. When they mature after three years, they move offshore and grow to as large as four feet and weigh from 15 to 70 pounds. However, many of the fish near the shore do not school and lead solitary lives. 
The winter flounder is a master of camouflage. It can actually change its color or color pattern to match the bottom. Flounder larvae start out swimming like normal fish. However, as a larva develops, it begins to swim on its side and the eye facing the bottom migrates to the top. In addition to changing color, they can bury themselves so that just their eyes are visible as they wait for prey. Finding a half-buried flounder can be rather difficult. This sea raven also uses its camouflage to blend into its weedy, rocky habitat. Its coloring can be bright yellow, red, or orange, though it's often a duller brown or maroon. Sea ravens live on the bottom and have large mouths full of rows of small, sharp teeth. Another inhabitant of rocky and stony bottom areas is the lumpfish. Its body is covered by hard, wart-like protrusions called tubercles. Lumpfish are one of the few fish that guard their eggs, a job done by the male. The eggs take six to eight weeks to hatch. During this time, the male doesn't eat and only leaves to drive off predators. He also fans the eggs with his fins keeping them free of silt and supplied with lots of oxygen. This fish is called a cunner or sea perch. Cunners live close to shore among rocks and pilings and prey on crustaceans, mollusks, worms, and small fish. Sea ravens and lumpfish are not the only creatures living on the Gulf of Maine's floor. One class of bottom dweller is the crustacean, part of the phylum known as the arthropod. Crustaceans have segmented bodies, hard shells, and multiple pairs of jointed legs. The crustacean most closely associated with the main coast is the lobster. Lobsters lay an average of 10,000 eggs, though larger lobsters can lay as many as 100,000 eggs at a time. When the eggs hatch, the larvae swim on the surface for four to six weeks before settling on the bottom. Out of 50,000 eggs, only two lobsters will make it to adulthood. Lobsters continue to grow throughout their lives. It takes five to seven years for a lobster to reach one pound in weight. The largest lobster on record reached 44 pounds. Since their hard shells constrain their growth, lobsters, as is true for other crustaceans, must periodically shed their shells and grow new ones. If the lobster has lost a claw, that claw will regenerate during the molting process. Prior to molting, the lobster grows a new, soft shell underneath its exoskeleton. If it has lost a claw or other limb, that limb will begin to regenerate. At the time of molting, the exterior shell, leached of many of its minerals, breaks apart as the lobster absorbs water and expands its size. It then must pull its various legs and antennules out of the old shell. Before the new shell hardens, the lobster absorbs more water, further expanding the size of its new carapace. Lobsters have a highly developed sense of smell and taste. They use their short antennae covered with hundreds of small hairs to detect chemicals in the water. By flicking these antennules downward to remove the old water, they get a new odor sample from which they are able to locate nearby animals. Lobsters were once thought to be scavengers, but research has shown they prefer fresh food, including fish, crabs, mussels, urchins, and even other lobsters. When a lobster eats, it chews its food in its stomach. The food is ground up by three hard surfaces known as a gastric mill.
Several varieties of shrimp inhabit the Gulf of Maine. Shrimp, too, are crustaceans. These small, translucent mysid shrimp range up to an inch in length. Unlike true bottom dwellers, mysids hover or swim in large groups above the sandy bottom, kicking water past their mouths and filtering out suspended particles of food. Sand shrimp, larger than mysids, have a mottled appearance that allows them to blend in with their surroundings. Typically, they bury themselves in the sand, making them even harder to locate. Here, though, you can see some sand shrimp disturbed by a sea star. Both mysid and sand shrimp are a major source of food for fish, especially flounder. Like jellyfish and lobsters, shrimp have statocysts to keep themselves oriented in the water. Statocysts are fluid-filled sense organs that contain one or more sandy particles. These sandy pieces, weighed down by gravity, help the shrimp distinguish between up and down. This northern Caridian shrimp, found in shallow waters, can grow to more than three inches. Over 125 years ago, the 19th century naturalist Louis Agassiz described barnacles as a little shrimp-like animal standing on its head in a limestone house and kicking food into its mouth. As a crustacean, Barnacles are related to shrimp as well as to crabs, lobsters, and copepods. In the larval or newly hatched stage, they look like shrimp and swim free as part of the plankton. As a barnacle gets older, it chooses a spot to settle down and glues itself head first to a hard surface. Within a day, the barnacle becomes an adult barnacle complete with its volcano-shaped house made of chitin. Barnacles can be found in the intertidal zone at the edge of the sea. When the tide goes out, the barnacle seals itself into its house by closing a trap door made of four movable top plates. When the trap door is closed, a barnacle can survive great extremes of sun, rain, exposure to air, and freezing temperatures. Barnacles are filter feeders, using feather-like feet called cirri to sweep the water for food particles. Smaller cirri scrape the trapped particles of food into the barnacle's mouth. Crabs are decapod crustaceans, meaning they have ten legs. The first two legs are modified into claws, used for eating, signaling, and defense. This crab has only one claw and seems uncertain whether to run away or attack our camera. A crab can lose a claw or a leg while escaping from a predator, such as a gull. If a gull has hold of a limb, the crab can constrict a special set of muscles that detaches the limb from its body. This can be a lifesaver. As is true of lobsters, crabs are able to regenerate lost limbs. Molting occurs when a crab outgrows its shell and needs to replace it with a new one. This starts when the crab sheds its old shell and begins to secrete a new shell. This process is accompanied by a rapid absorption of water, which temporarily increases the crab's body size. During this stage, the crab is vulnerable to predators. Gradually, the new shell hardens, and over time, new muscles and tissues grow to fill the space. Crabs walk sideways because their joints can bend, but not rotate. A close-up view of a crab reveals several interesting features. Their compound eyes are on eye stalks and give the crab a wide view over a range of light conditions. Even though the image obtained is a mosaic, there is evidence from their behavior that crabs perceive a good image and can detect small movements. The two pincer-like antennules are sense organs, the crab's nose. Below is the crab's mouth, seen more easily as it eats an urchin. In this area are special appendages adapted to putting food into its mouth. Crabs can be scavengers, eating the food left behind by others, but they also prey on pretty much any animal they can catch. For many crab species, mating takes place between a hard-shelled male and a smaller, newly molted female. The male will carry around the female for several days, protecting her from predators during her most vulnerable period. 
the female extrudes her fertilized eggs onto the swimmerettes under her abdomen. While most crab bodies are covered with a hard shell, hermit crabs don't grow shells of their own. They use empty snail or whelk shells to protect their soft abdomens. They can easily leave their borrowed shells and will seek larger ones that fit better as they grow. This hairy hermit crab is trying to remove a periwinkle from its shell. This hermit crab is checking out a larger shell. Here, an Acadian hermit crab is trying to dislodge another from its shell, which is hard to do. Hermit crabs have two pairs of highly modified legs that allow them to grab hold of the inside of the shell with such force that they usually cannot be removed in one piece. on the shell of some hermit crabs is actually a hydroid colony called snail fur. They are usually only found on hermit crab shells. Each individual member of this primitive colony has a specific function like feeding, defense, or reproduction. Hermit crabs are scavengers and will feed on just about anything they can find. This one is sifting through sediment for food particles. Living on the bottom without being eaten often means being able to stay hidden from view. The spider crab has a particularly effective way of camouflaging itself. It fastens bits of algae, seaweed, and debris to hooked hairs that cover its body. The algae will grow until the crab is hard to tell apart from the local surroundings. Spider crabs can grow to about 4 inches and are slow and sluggish as far as crabs go, mostly scavenging for food. Another group, or phylum, of bottom dwellers is the mollusk. Mollusks are soft-bodied animals enclosed in hard shells made of calcium carbonate. Univalves, such as periwinkles, whelks, and snails, have a single shell. Bivalves, such as mussels, clams, and scallops, have two shells that are hinged together. The periwinkle, a common type of mollusk found along the main seashore, has a round shell that grows to about an inch in diameter. Periwinkles can survive in intertidal zones, where they are commonly found because they conceal themselves inside their shells, thus enduring exposure to the air for up to a week. They can also withstand high heat, as much as 150 degrees for 12 hours. Periwinkles use a specialized organ with tiny teeth called a radula to scrape away algae from rocks and other hard surfaces. As they wear away the teeth in front, they grow new ones behind. These teeth move forward as if on a slow-moving conveyor belt to replace the worn teeth. The waved whelk also has a radula, but it's at the end of its proboscis. It uses it to bore holes in the shells of bivalves, not to scrape algae. In addition to preying on live food, the whelk will also scavenge on dead fish, or as we see here, on the remains of an urchin. The whelk moves by shifting muscles in its foot.
The northern moon snail, like the whelk, plows along the bottom looking for bivalves to eat. It too uses its radula to drill a hole into the shell of its prey, through which it sucks out the soft body parts. Believe it or not, the enormous foot of the moon snail can be completely retracted into its shell. The foot is inflated with water when out of the shell. To retract it, the snail expels the water, making it considerably smaller. The egg cases of the northern moon snail are called sand collars and are sometimes found while walking on a beach. Blue mussels crowd together in dense beds. Because they can close their two shells tightly enough to allow in no air, like periwinkles and barnacles, they can survive in the intertidal zone of the coast. Mussels are filter feeders. They eat by sucking water over their mucus-covered gills, trapping food particles that they then transfer to their mouths with hair-like cilia. Each mussel processes between 10 and 15 gallons of water per day, consuming almost everything in it. A mussel moves by pulling itself along by its foot. This allows the mussel to reposition itself for better feeding. Scallops, another variety of bivalves, can move around by jet propulsion. When they clap their two shells together, water is forced out, moving them forward. Like the blue mussel, scallops are filter feeders. Since mature scallops tend to remain still if undisturbed, a large number of creatures compete for space on the scallop's shell, which may help the scallop remain undetected by predators like starfish. Scallops have a ring of blue eyes along the edge of their mantle. These eyes can probably only detect passing shadows. The short tentacles are sensory organs. Scallops can grow to eight inches. This large shell shows the tracks made by worms that bore into it. The familiar starfish is a member of the phylum known as echinoderms. Echinoderms have a hard, spiny skin, a central mouth, and a five-part radial symmetry. Echinoderm skeletons are made up of interlocking plates and spines made of bone-hard calcium carbonate. In starfish, the plates are loosely bound to allow the arms of the starfish to move. Of course, starfish are not fish at all and are more properly called sea stars. The sea star is common in the shallow waters of the Gulf of Maine and can grow to 8 inches. Frequently they lose limbs to predators, but they can regenerate lost limbs as you can see here. In some cases, a sea star can regenerate into a whole animal from just one arm and half of its center disc. The tube feet on sea stars and other echinoderms are quite interesting. The feet are controlled by a water vascular system. Water enters the system through a button-shaped structure, the madreporite, on the top of the sea star. An internal canal connects the madreporite with the central circular ring canal. Radial canals extend from the ring canal down each of the sea star's arms. Two rows of tube feet are attached to each of these radial canals. Each tube foot has a bulb called an ampulla. By contracting muscles on the ampulla, fluid is forced into the tube foot, extending it. By contracting muscles in the tube foot, fluid is returned to the ampulla and the tube foot is retracted. At the end of the tube foot is a strong sucker. In addition to secreting a glue, the sucker adheres by vacuum pressure. When the foot needs to be lifted, a chemical is released by the sucker which breaks down the glue, breaking the seal. The strength of the combined tube feet allows sea stars to climb up a vertical rock face. While the movement of individual tube feet seems uncoordinated, 
Overall, they are highly coordinated and sea stars roam freely over the sea's bottom. The sea star eats by draping itself over its prey, preferably mussels, and using its tube feet to pull apart the shell. It then pushes its stomach out its mouth opening into the mussel shell, where it digests the mussel's soft body. Here you can see its protruding stomach. Sea stars do not have specialized sense organs. They do have small, simple eye spots at the end of their arms and sensory cells at the ends of their tube feet. These daisy brittle stars, another species of sea star, move their long, snake-like arms for locomotion. Here we can see a daisy brittle star's elaborate efforts to turn itself over. They are called brittle stars because they will readily break off any trapped portion of their arms. This red-orange blood star grows to only 2 inches and feeds on sponges. Sun stars have more than 5 arms, usually 9 to 10, but sometimes as many as 14. They grow to as large as 16 inches and can have spiny arms, as we see here on this small sun star, or smooth arms, as we see on these larger specimens. Their colors can vary from reddish-orange to gold to purple. The sea urchin, another common echinoderm in the Gulf of Maine, has a body structure that looks something like a sea star with its legs wrapped inwards to form a sphere. The outer surface of the sphere is covered with spines, rows of tube feet, and small pinchers, called pedicellaria, which are used for defense, holding onto food, and keeping the urchin clear of debris. The skeleton of an urchin is called a test, and it's made of the same calcium carbonate plates that sea stars have, except that the plates are fused together in the urchin. The bumps are where the spines were once connected. The holes, arranged along the same five-part plan found in the sea star, are where the tube feet passed through the test. A sea urchin's mouth, found at the base of its spherical form, has a complicated arrangement of five teeth called Aristotle's lantern, after the Greek philosopher who first described it. Aristotle's lantern is used to scrape away at the surface over which the sea urchin moves. As you can see, the lantern can be raised, lowered, or swung in an arc. Sea urchins prefer to eat algae and seaweed, but also eat small animals and dead fish as well. They are often found in vast numbers and can strip an area of virtually all plant life, leaving an underwater urchin desert. You would think that the spines of sea urchins would deter predators, but a surprising number of species feed on urchins, including sea stars, crabs, lobsters, cod, and other fish. An urchin doesn't have a brain, as we think of it, but rather a nerve ring, which processes the input from the sensory cells that cover its body and controls the tube feet and spines. These sand dollars are feeding on microorganisms found on the bottom. Sand dollars are echinoderms that resemble flattened urchins with tiny spines. By examining one, you can see the radial plan that is characteristic of echinoderms. Their skeletons often wash up on shore.
When disturbed or taken out of the water, a sea cucumber looks like a fruit from a garden. Its plump shape is due to its ability to inflate itself with water. On the ocean floor, with its tentacles extended, the sea cucumber still looks like a plant, but it's an echinoderm, as are sea stars. Surrounding the sea cucumber's mouth are 10 to 30 tube feet highly modified into tentacles. The tentacles filter zooplankton from the water, and then one by one, the tentacles transfer this food into the sea cucumber's mouth. The five-part radial symmetry common to echinoderms can be seen in the rows of tube feet that stretch from the sea cucumber's mouth to its anus. Only the feet located on the bottom of the sea cucumber's body are well developed. It uses these feet primarily to attach itself to the bottom, though they can be used for limited locomotion. Their anal opening is used for both respiration and discharging wastes. If a sea cucumber is sufficiently disturbed, it will eject its digestive tract and its respiratory trees at the opening. Fortunately, all the lost internal body parts are regenerated within a few weeks. Sea cucumber skeletons contain the same type of calcium carbonate plates that make up the bodies of sea stars and urchins. However, where the sea stars are loosely connected and the urchins are fused together, the sea cucumbers are microscopic and embedded in the skin. They are called ossicles and have many interesting shapes. This fan worm from the phylum Annelida also looks something like a plant. The fan worm's body, which is about 8 inches long, consists of 60 segments wrapped in a leathery tube. Its crown of tentacles trap small food particles from the water, and beating cilia transfer them into the worm's mouth. Fan worms rapidly contract into their tubes if the slightest shadow falls on their eye spots. This fast contraction is due to a single giant nerve running the length of the worm. This sea peach is also an animal. It filters food from the water by pumping water in one pore and out the other. They are called sea squirts because of their habit of squirting water if they are removed from the sea. The anemone is another variety of bottom dweller that resembles a flower. It belongs to the phylum Nidaria. The tentacles have special cells, called nematocysts, which sting and paralyze prey. Anemones are capable of slow, clumsy movement on their adhesive discs, which allows them to find better feeding spots, but once positioned, they depend on the current or chance to bring prey to them. The colorful northern red anemone with short, thick tentacles sits on the sandy bottom, looking a bit like a potted plant, while the tube anemone lies buried with only its mouth and tentacles showing, at least until it's disturbed. The numerous small tentacles of the frilled anemone sway in the current, capturing zooplankton and occasionally small fish or other animals that blunder into their grasp. When resting or disturbed, frilled anemones can totally retract their tentacles. Here, the frilled anemones have caught a lion's mane, which appears determined to pull itself free.
The lion's mane, or red jelly, is also a member of the phylum Nidaria, though its body type, or form, differs from the anemones. The anemone represents the phylum's polyp form. The jellyfish is an example of the medusa form. The lion's mane has eight long clusters of tentacles on its underside. Commonly about 18 inches across, this jellyfish can grow into a giant between three and eight feet wide. On those rare, huge specimens, the tentacles can extend up to 200 feet. The stalked jellyfish is related to moon jellies, but cannot swim and spends its life attached to rocks and plants. Its tentacles are used to capture plankton, worms, and even small fish. One of the most beautiful summer inhabitants of the Gulf of Maine is the moon jelly. This jellyfish, which can grow up to a foot across, has short tentacles that produce only a gentle sting in most people. Although a moon jelly doesn't have a brain, it does have a nerve network with photo and mechanical receptors located around the rim of its bell. The photoreceptors serve as primitive eyes, distinguishing between light and dark. The mechanical receptors trigger nerve impulses that control the moon jelly's rhythmic muscle contraction. Moon jellies feed on small plankton they catch on sticky bands and lick off by one of four mouth arms. Moon jellies are themselves part of the plankton, as they can only drift with the current. Many researchers believe that the first living creatures developed in the oceans 500 million years ago. Billions upon billions of individual animals, representing millions of different species, have participated in a vast interconnected web of life that we find in our oceans. A web that spans the largest whale to the smallest copepod. We've looked at just a few of the thousands of species of animals that inhabit the Gulf of Maine. We hope we have shown you enough for you to appreciate what wonderful creatures live beneath its surface. <laughs>